So hello everyone, uh, welcome to, I don't know what number of classes this is, but we've had quite a few up until now and it's going really well, I think. Um, and today we're uh, part one talking about the high holidays. So I could not fit everything into one lesson. So today I'm going from the beginning, uh, talking a little bit about uh, Rosh Hashanah, Teshuva, Selicha, and then uh, we'll have a couple of exercises and we'll end um, before Yom Kippur, basically. So next session would be about more to do with Yom Kippur. So um, just to get started, uh, I would like to ask everybody, what do you think are the three most important holidays in the Torah? So let's just um, unmute and talk about that for a couple of minutes. Sukkot was historically the big one. So there's three. Oh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Passover, Pesach. Pretty sure Shabbat is one. Everyone. <laughs> I, I would also Shabbat. agree with the uh, Passover. <laughs> would, the big, would the big three be um, um, Pesach, Sukkot, and Shabbat? Shavuot. Well, they were big because it was uh, when they made pilgrimage to the to the temple to Jerusalem. If I recall. Uh -huh. Okay, so the three that we make pilgrimages to Jerusalem are which uh, Pesach, uh, Sukkot, and Shavuot. Exactly. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> Pesach, Sukkot, and Shavuot, which are known as the Hagim pilgrimage holidays. Yeah. And why might Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah not be those? Why might they not be the most important ones? Hmm. What do we think? Time to make a pilgrimage. <laughs> yeah. They're not pilgrimage holidays, yeah. Anybody got any ideas? I mean, historically, because they didn't need to to get the the more food to the priests, but that's a a sociological thing, not a religious thing. Uh, I have no idea. Right. So, um, where is yeah. Rosh Hashanah on on this calendar? Tish, uh, Rosh Hashanah, Tishrei. Tishrei. Yeah, the, Tishrei, yeah. The thing is is that the first of the year was Nisan, was in Pesach. Yeah, hang on a sec. <laughs> yeah. So, so where is Tishrei? September, October. Yeah, and which month is that? Oh, uh, the first, no. No. Uh, no. One, two, three, this one was the first five, one. six, seven, seventh. The seventh month, yeah. Mm. So Rosh Hashanah is on the seventh month. So Gabrielle said, but maybe if somebody else knows this or or didn't hear Gabrielle, do you want to say which is the first month? Um, Nisan, because it's spring. <laughs> oh, <I'm... laughs> Sorry, Gabrielle, it's fine. <laughs> Don't worry. So, yeah, Nisan. Nisan is uh, the first month. Yeah. So does anybody think that's kind of strange that the new year is in the seventh month? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so we'll have a look. Uh, we'll have a look at why that might be. So the biblical name for Rosh Hashanah is Yom Teruah, not Rosh Hashanah. Uh, and who else that hasn't said anything yet knows what Yom Teruah means? I need you not to with, unmute. Not without Googling it, I don't know. No, don't Google it. <laughs> 
So who who does know what Yom Teruah means? Who doesn't know? <laughs> I can't I can't see who doesn't know. <laughs> no, um, I don't know. Does, does does that mean nobody knows what Yom Teruah means? Um, oh, day of blasting. Sorry, I I didn't hear that you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, that's what that's one that's one uh, translation of it. Yeah, day of blasting, blasting. Um, Rebecca, you put your hand up, but just you just unmute. Oh, just to signify that I wasn't sure what it meant. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, so day of blasting. Um, yeah, so let's have a look at what uh, the Torah says. Uh, can somebody please read the uh, Hebrew if you are able to? Adonai el Moshe Leomer Dabar al Israel Leomer Pachodesh Bashvi Baida la Hodesh Adonai la no Ielachem Shabaton Vesichron Terua Nikra Kodesh. Kodesh. Yeah. So that's Leviticus 23, 23 to 24. And Yotevavhe spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel saying, in the seventh month, in the first day of the month, you shall have a Shabbaton memorial proclaimed with a loud sound or a holy convocation. Um, does, who knows what Shabbaton is? Shabbat of Shabbat. Yeah, a big Shabbat, it means. A very a big Shabbat. Yeah. So so this day, this in the seventh the first day of the seventh month is a big Shabbat, regardless of it whether it's Saturday or not. Um, which is also a memorial, which is to be proclaimed with a loud sound and it is a holy convocation, a, a holy gathering. So that's that's what is mentioned that we now call Rosh Hashanah. So it doesn't mention it being the, the the new year. So in the Torah, it's not the new year. Uh, is anybody that hasn't said anything yet surprised by that? How do you feel about that? How do you feel about that? <laughs> I know there are going multiple new years, though. Yeah, so how do you feel about the fact that this is not a new year in the Torah? It's kind of strange. Yeah. Anybody else? What are, what are our thoughts about this? This is confusing. Like, <laughs> I didn't hear that. Was that Rebecca? Oh. Was that Rebecca? No, I didn't say anything. I can. Anybody else? Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah. Um, Everyone's asleep. Let's wake up. Is it strange <laughs> that it's not a new year? I mean, I would have to look at why specifically it's not considered a new year. Um, is there some kind of social reason or agricultural reason, or maybe they just felt like, hey, this just doesn't count as a new year? Um, so I guess those are my my thoughts. Yeah, okay. And anybody else? Yeah, Let's talk to each other, people. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> so I'm speculating, uh, because I don't know which came first, that uh, I don't know when uh, the idea of reading the Torah over the, the year started. But I do know it starts uh, after uh, Simchat Torah, Simchat Torah, uh, 
comes after uh, Yom Kippur. Uh, but also, I suppose, I don't know, it's, uh, I mean, we have Nisan as spring. Maybe this was fall. Maybe this was the beginning of the rain seasons. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm speculating. I don't know what the religious reasons were. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, so I don't know which came first, the hen or the egg, actually. Which yeah, sure. Egg. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, as um, the other person mentioned, I think it was Laurie. I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, there are four. Yeah, there are four New Years. Yeah, so yeah. this is this is one of them, but it is not the New Year in the Torah. Okay, so it's a high holiday. Um, so a high holiday is um, not the same thing as a New Year. So we call it a, a high holiday. Okay, so we've got we've got that bit out of the way. Uh, so now we can talk about uh, some of the traditions that we do on Rosh Hashanah. So we've established that Rosh Hashanah in the Torah is not a new year, but it, is be it has become a new year, and it's become the most important new year for rabbinic Jews. Because for Karaite Jews, it's not the new year. The first of Nisan is the new year. And all Samaritans who, who have Torah-only religion. Um, okay, so uh, these are pictures that come from people that attend Binoza Chabura. Um and does anybody know what any of them are and I want to get some engagement from people so a few people saying what what these signs are so Simani means sign so we on Rosh Hashanah we have a Seder of signs of symbols so a few people to say like do you know what any of them are I know that the the head of the um I think that's an artichoke. I know that's symbolic of um Rosh Hashanah because it literally it means head of the year. Yep. Is it an artichoke? It is. It is thank. Yes. <laughs> so I understand the pomegranate it means being very fruitful. Isn't it uh, isn't there a tradition that the pomegranate has 618 Third. seeds? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it signifies mitzvot. Yeah. Um, also, if you can see on the bottom right, there's not an artichoke. What What is there that might be the head? Apple? Nope. Oh, no. It looks like a very unhealthy pumpkin. Oh, oh this is a different... Yeah. That, uh, those are decorative pumpkins, they. Yeah, but it's and not the pumpkin. It's not the pumpkin. My, what else might be the head? Uh, oh, the head. Sorry, I was gonna say figs, but that wasn't it. Right now, it's the fish. Yeah, the fish. Where's the fish? So, there's a fish on the bottom fish. right. There's <laughs> a fish. Normally, normally it's a fish head, but this person, I can't remember picture this was but um uh they put a fish not a fish head but that's fine so it's a fish head or a uh artichoke so what else is there apples and honey yeah and, and what do they signify um it's like isn't it like hope for sweetness in the new year yes exactly sweetness yeah i can't see the chat can somebody read what's in the chat Oh, that was me. I said I was looking at the wrong picture. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> that's fine. What else do you see in the picture? Well, I see the 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 horn. Uh. Uh. Well, in the on the seder. Yeah, on the seder. Yeah. Oh, you mean on the picture? <laughs> mm -hmm. Green beans. Three beans, yeah. Do you know what they signify? No idea. Okay. Is it? Is it maybe? Oh no, I've got, I have no idea. Okay, so that's kara, which in Aramaic and Hebrew means to cut. So it's to cut up our uh, negative deeds from the year before, or our enemies, or anything like that. 
Um, yeah. Somebody else say what they see? Around Hala. Around Hala, yeah. Around Hala is not one of the Simanim, but um, do you want to say what, what you know about that, about the Hala? Um, symbolizes like the cycle of the year, I believe. Exactly, yeah. And it's sweet, right? It's, yeah. it's a sweet Hala, yeah, exactly. Anything else? The uh, metal cup of something. Uh, it's the Kiddush cup. That's ah, the okay. wine. Yeah, the wine is not part of the Simanim, the uh, symbols, but it is part of, I mean, Kiddush is part of every festival. Uh, there are other fruits. Mm -hmm. It's like dates. Dates, exactly. Does anybody know what they signify? Nope. Okay. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> the hard part is over. Um, we'll get to that in a sec. Uh, can somebody please read? Uh, somebody that hasn't read yet, that hasn't said anything, please read. Uh, I can read the, I guess, half of it or all of it if you want. Yeah, if you read half of it and then somebody else that hasn't that hasn't said anything yet. Okay, sure. Yeah, great, uh, thank you. Yeah, the custom of displaying and eating a number of fruits and vegetables representing simanim, omens or signs, for the coming year is practiced widely by Sephardim and others throughout the world. This practice, mentioned twice in the Talmud, 3rd to 6th centuries, yeah. is of ancient origin. In one reference, the simanim yeah. were simply displayed and in the second, they were also eaten. The addition of blessings came later. Uh, Rav Hai Gaon, I hope that I'm saying that right, late 10th century Baghdad, was reported to have blessed each one of a basket of different fruits presented to him by his disciples. Okay. Uh, can somebody else take over? Manuel, maybe? Are you there? He, he put something yeah, in. I'll, I'll give it a try. Yeah. <laughs> the proceedings were codified in the tour, uh, 14th century. And then the Datsulan Aruch, 16th century. Shulchan Aruch, yeah. Uh, Shulchan Aruch, yeah. 16th century. It was actively promoted by Rabbi Isaac Luria in 16th century and gained widespread acceptance. Different communities substituted fruits and vegetables more readily available to them for their simamin. So customs varied from country to country. That of apple dipped in honey came from Ashkenazi Europe. Okay, and carry on. <laughs> oh, you want me to continue? Yes, please, yeah. Yeah, just a second. Uh, the custom of displaying and eating a number of fruits and vegetables representing simanim, or omens or signs. For sorry, the sorry. Um, we've already read that. It's just the last sentence, please. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm a little bit out of it. I'll be honest, my head's kind of foggy. Uh, Simamin, remind us of our hopes for the coming year and to express hopes for prosperity, strength, and peace. Thanks. Thank you. So, this, so the Seda Simanim was the standard in the whole Jewish world, and the apples and honey uh, just came from Ashkenazim. So this it's in the Talmud, um, if, if you get dating back to the third century, um, and only today mainly Sephardim keep this tradition. Um, and obviously we have done it for the last two years, I believe, at Bin Loza Chavara, and it's become, I suppose, part of our tradition. And I'm glad about that because it's uh, um, not just, you know, we don't only do Ashkenazi tradition at Bin Loza Chavara. Um, so the symbols are, just to uh, recap, uh, can I have uh, people read them? Dates, Tamar, P equals peace. Yes. Beans, Rubia, Fijones is equal or increase merits. Pomegranates or rimonium or mango, mangranos equals mitzvot.
the gourd, kara or calabaza, tear or render. The fish or artichoke head, rush or cavesta, being the head. Apple and honey, matuka, manzana, si miel, equal good and sweet. That's kind of the light aspect of Rosh Hashanah, of the high holidays, having this said the simanim. But, but uh, Rosh Hashanah also involves a lot of heavy stuff. So that is shuva or tshuva. Um, who knows what? Shuva might mean. Literally means return, but um, more broadly means repentance. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So can I, can Adam, could you continue reading? I was muted. Let's see. Um, yeah, yeah. The Rambam states in Ilhot Teshuvah, every person should view himself all year as if he were half innocent and half guilty, and that is the way he should look at the world as well, as if it were half innocent and half guilty. If he would do just one sin, he would thereby tip both himself and the entire world towards the guilty side and cause it great destruction. And if he would do just one mitzvah, he would tip both himself and the entire world towards the innocent side and cause for himself and for them salvation. As it says, the righteous person is the foundation of the world, because his being righteous tipped the world for good and saved it. And because of this, the whole house of Israel have accustomed themselves to give more tzedakah, charity, and do more good deeds, and to engage in mitzvot, from Rosh Hashanah through Yom Kippurim more then, than the rest of the year. And they have adopted the custom my thing is, and they have, a, and they have adopted the custom of rising at night during this ten-year period, and praying in the synagogues prayers of supplication and entreaties until daylight. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I wanted to uh, see what the group thinks of uh, some of the concepts in here. So, for example, doing one mitzvah, you would tip yourself, uh, both yourself and the whole world, towards the innocent. How does it, that seem, feel? it seems like a lot of responsibility, almost like a weight on you to have that kind of responsibility. Exactly. Yes, very much so. Yeah, that's that's very much the feel of the high holiday period, that there's a weight on you. Yeah. What else do we think about this? At the same time, it recognizes that there's we all have the capability of doing both good and bad, not only of ourselves in, in ourselves but also the world. So it kind of uh, it can make you feel a lot of guilt, but it can also uh, make you feel maybe more uh, empath empathy. It's not that everyone else is guilty and I am the innocent one. But just that we are all can, I don't know. Uh, uh, that's how I I try to look at it. Uh, yeah. Yes. So, you it kind of it? reminds me, in a way, of my partner is Catholic, and um, they confess. She's not religious. She hasn't been in confession in like twenty years, but they confess. But yet, it's different because for them, there's like a belief that. People are basically bad, that we're bad and dark, the dark side the whole time, and not this balance. I like the idea of being balanced a lot better. Yeah, me too. Yeah, we're half guilty, half in, half innocent. Yeah. Um, can I can I share? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, just for me reading this. Um, my kind of reaction to it is that um, you bear, you know, responsibility for all of your actions. So it uh, seems like it's a way to have you self-reflect 
on the good things you've done or the maybe not so great things you've done and just to yeah kind of have that responsibility for any actions you take good or bad um and Lori talked about catholicism which was interesting <laughs> uh my husband's also a catholic so there's that whole kind of culpability <laughs> in that in catholicism um uh where you know but they believe in original sin so you know <laughs> that's all different but at least you know with this uh as you pointed out Lori there's the um yeah maybe you have culpability but you're also innocent so there's like kind of a scales there there's good and bad uh, yeah thank you and i just i want to focus a little bit on this um the whole house of israel and the righteous person is the foundation of the world so if um only a small amount of people are accustomed to doing good deeds um to giving charity, to repentance, and and that the righteous person is the foundation of the world uh, that can tip the world and save it. How might we interpret that as humanistic Jews? Um, I would say, al almost literally, I don't think what you've just stated requires any anything supernatural um i also believe it's true sociologically that um great change for good is generally these sort of movements it's usually a relatively small portion of the society that actually participates in them exactly. so I, think I think it's accurate as well as uh as well as you know inspirational I mean, that's exactly what I think about it. Does anyone have the opposing view? We, we are Jewish. <laughs> it would be good to have opposing views. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that for me, um, um, the, the, this is not an opposing view. It reminds me of Buddhism because... Um, you know, they also have, you can go either way that it's balanced and you can choose whether you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. But for something, the beginning part feels like almost too much responsibility. It feels like a lot of responsibility, but the second part, I do agree that a small group of people like can make a difference, like in sociological studies, you know, like they did a, they would do it and they would have like put smoke in the room. And if nobody said anything nobody would just sit there and even though there was smoke coming in the room and if one person said there's smoke coming everybody would run away so it, it does there's something really right about that idea of like it, it just takes a small number of people to do the right thing to influence the others sometimes i, I like that part um yeah me too thank you um i I would prefer it if he described humans as partly innocent and partly guilty rather than half, um, because I just don't think it's that simple. I think it may be a device. 85% innocent and... <laughs> <laughs> I, think I think you may be using it as a device. <laughs> you've, never, <laughs> you've never met my family. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so the Rambam, Maimonides, uh, discussed four stages of teshuva. Some people, uh, some people list five, um, and they are recognize and discontinue the behavior, verbally confess the action, make it real. So it's a misunderstanding that Judaism doesn't have confession. We do have confession. Um, and it's part of the shuva. Um To regret eval and evaluate the impact on the self and other, and to determine never to repeat the action. Those are four stages of the shuva. Recognize and discontinue, verbally confess, and that normally should be public, a public confession with a witness. Regret, evaluate the uh, impact on self and other, and determine never to repeat. And if the person refuses to forgive after three attempts, they become guilty of holding a grudge. 
So according to the Hil Hilchot Teshuvah of, uh, of the Rambam, um, you are supposed to ask for forgiveness three times. And you're supposed to do it sincerely and following this order. And if you've done that three times and the other person refuses to forgive you, then you are absolved of that. And the other person now has the sin of holding a grudge because you're not allowed to hold a grudge in Judaism. So um, all of that stuff has to be done publicly as well. You, you, you're not supposed to do it in secret. You're not supposed to go to that person in secret and, and apologize. You're supposed to sincerely um, apologize and seek forgiveness with a witness. And that also helps because if the other person refuses uh, to forgive you, you have a witness that they have refused you. And then you go back another time and you have a witness that they have refused you a second time. And if you go back a third time and they still uh, refuse to forgive you in the presence of a witness, then you have a witness that you have done to Shuva and that person has not forgiven you. And you do not have to continue asking for forgiveness. So it's a very different uh, form of forgiveness from other from other religions. So, for example, in Christianity, forgiveness looks very different. Um, I'm not quite sure how to um, summarize what Christian forgiveness looks like, but if somebody in the room knows uh, and wants to tell us, then please go ahead. One thing I would say that's very similar with what Maimonides describes Teshuva, it does look a lot like the pattern of of reconciliation that's outlined in the teachings of Jesus in one of the Gospels, I think. It, there's some similarities. What I think is different is, is um, well, what's, what, what's very similar is you going going to the person directly, going to them repeatedly if necessary, going with the witness. Those are all things in the text. What I think is different, though, is more the practical effects of forgiveness. And so I think in Christianity, sometimes there's a sense of that that means completely forgetting that the thing ever happened, um, not being aware of, as, as a human being, that sometimes you do need to protect yourself from someone who's harmful. And I don't think that part is as clear in Christianity as it should be. But this process here, Maimonides' process, it looks almost identical to what the New Testament shows. So that, that to me, is super interesting. Yeah. And this is this is about humans as well. So yeah. you cannot, even according to Maimonides, you cannot ask God to forgive you for your behavior. You have to ask the person who you have behaved badly against. So God has nothing to do with, um, even for the most orthodox, God has nothing to do with this process. It's, God is not mentioned in this process. So it's only the things that you've done against God that you're supposed to ask God to forgive you for. So that's another difference, isn't it? Because, um, you know, I hear like from a, a lot of evangelical Christians that they did such and such, um, that they used to be, I don't know, a gang member, that they used to rob people. Um, and then they uh, became a Christian and then um, God forgave them. And the person that they wronged is not mentioned in that process. Whereas in, in this, God is not mentioned in the process, which I, which I think is very humanistic. I, I think this whole process is very, very humanistic. I don't, I don't think it sounds religious to me at all. And ironically, it is a hilchot, a religious law of repentance. So um, on that note, we're going to have an exercise. Um, and I need uh, us to be split up into groups of two, um, put, put into groups of two, if that's possible, but, uh, or three, if that's easier to divide. Um, but please don't press assign yet, because I need to give us the exercise. Sure, I'll, I'll get the room set up. I think it looks like we have yes. 13 participants, so I'll do it as four groups of three, and then um, and then Martin, you'll be you can join groups if you want to, but I, I won't count you. So, but so I, will, perhaps, I will. Yes, perhaps you 
you, me, and Paula and Betty Ann could be one group? I don't think I can. I could try that. I don't know how to do Let, let me work on that. Okay, cool. Okay, so our exercise oh, is going I, I to be... I do know how to tell James to do that. Exclude the hosts and then reassign the hosts. Okay. Great. So our, our exercise is going to be quickly practice these four stages of teshuva in groups. And um, you might need to take note uh, or when all of them are on the screen, um, take a screenshot or something so that you can see what um, we're going to be doing. And it's um, name one behavior to yourself, not out loud, from the past week that you from the past week that you wish to discontinue. Then so you have to take a minute to do that in the group. Then verbally confess the action to the group. And then evaluate together the impact of that behavior on yourself and others. Why do you regret it? And why do you determine and and and, and say that you will determine never to repeat it? So it could be anything from you killed a you killed a spider or or something, but it should be human. It should be against humans. Um, is is it unclear to anybody? Can it be something that harms yourself, like health? Um, it has to be against another human. Okay. Yeah. Is it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it unclear to anybody? Um, I've act, I've been unusually well behaved this week, um, <laughs> but. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> the week before um, then. <laughs> okay, that's fine. sometime this year. I've I've probably done something dreadful. Um, I just right. have to rack, okay. rack my mind. But I want, but I want it to be recent. Recent, yeah, 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 recent. Pro probably okay. something last month. Yeah, that's fine. Any other questions? Or are we ready to assign the group? Okay, I, you can join groups. How how was that? Um, we've got. I'll go with group one. Uh, that was Adam, Casey, and David. How did you find it? Hard. <laughs> it was difficult. <laughs> yeah. Why? <laughs> It's hard to think of things. I don't know. Did you? Well, it's perfect. Yeah. Did you come up with anything? Yeah. Yeah. I still it. didn't. <laughs> no, David did not. No. <laughs> so, do you want to share anything about it? I mean, I can say what mine was. Um, it was really hard to think of. I've been on vacation all week. For my anniversary and so you know it's been a, like a nice mostly relaxing week but i did say that i i i'm a procrastinator when it comes to planning things and so i got us our airbnb but i didn't bother like clicking on all the links for the instructions until we were 30 minutes away and the links weren't working so i didn't know where we were supposed to park and I couldn't get a hold of the host. And so it was a very stressful start and it all worked out just fine. It turns out the parking is completely free where we were going on Sundays and we were getting there on Sunday. So it literally didn't matter. Um, but it was very stressful. So I uh, resolved not to procrastinate like that in the future. And, and it sounds like there was an opportunity in that for you to uh, examine the impact Yes. On yourself and others, right? And my spouse, yeah, my, my, yeah, my, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and the group two is Gabrielle, Guillermi, and Janet. Gil Guillermi, you haven't said anything yet. Do you want to share uh, some feedback from your group? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm really feeling. Uh, I'm really feeling good about the conversation because. That's so difficult because sometimes uh, I, I was talking with them that sometimes uh, I, I get angry with the few things in life, you know. But I, 
I'm really I'm really trying to to work on that and to improve this in shoot. Uh huh. Um. So did you did you think of any specific action, any specific behavior that you confessed to your group? Yeah, I say that sometimes uh, I get angry about few things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and how and how did your group feel about about the exercise? Uh, do you want to say something, Gabriel? Gabriel. Uh, okay. Um. Well, the thing is, what all of us had in common is that we were sharing things that have to do with habits. So more than in that in instances, we were talking about processes that affect us probably in the last week also, but we were talking about how to uh, to overcome the, calm those habits because they harm us and they harm the people around us. And they have to do with uh, different things that, that uh, yeah, that, where we hurt people and also ourselves. So we were talking about how to overcome them uh, because it's not just one action, but it's part of a, a pattern uh, or patterns. So we talk about, okay, first how one, one sees the problem, one wants to overcome it. First, one has to understand that one has it. One has to overcome it. Uh, Guillermo was talking about uh, problems managing or or dealing with uh, acting angrily when he feels angry, and uh, I was talking about uh, not getting back to people that have reached to me because I have uh, also procrastination issues and uh, because of ADD and stuff like that, and uh, how that becomes afterwards. Uh, so hard to overcome so it was very much in the interpersonal thing I mean it, it was we were not talking about uh, we were talking about how it affected people near us no it was not how, how to fix the whole world but how to oh, exactly yeah become better and, and overcome our things uh, yeah um, so it uh, sounds like you spoke a lot about that stage four determined never to repeat it yeah 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 Yeah. and how and how to go about that which is really positive um Mm -hmm. okay i I was gonna say oh i was gonna say that when i was in their group and we talked about that uh gabrielle brought up and it was just so valuable was that this is not like a light switch that you can change it's like a you need structure and support and developing strategies and that is not gonna happen fast because uh, I get, I multitask and I do it. I'm, I'm a natural ADD, but I, I do things to make it worse. I do actually make it worse uh, through, through my multitasking. And I know that I cannot stop that suddenly and that it will just take time. And I just, and we also did that with each of us, you know, just this idea of like, we're going to need to find structural ways to help shift. Cause I didn't want to promise that I was going to stop doing it because I knew I wouldn't stop doing it without developing strategies and supports. Yeah, thank you. I do, uh, I do want to add a caveat that um, illness, and I know that ADHD, ADD, autism, because we also spoke about that in my group, um, that conditions or neurodevelopmental differences are not necessarily uh things that you're doing wrong if if the cause of your behavior is something like a condition then it's not that you're doing something wrong this is uh something that you have to cope with in life and coming up with a strategy to cope with it is not the same thing as doing something against someone on purpose so i just want to add that caveat that even in orthodox judaism quote unquote illness is not um a behavior that comes from illness is not a sin in, in Orthodox Judaism, yeah, or, or in any other form of Judaism. Oh, oh yeah, um, thank you for saying that. I really appreciate that. Yeah, what I was saying is that I do stuff on top of my, no, <laughs> my I natural, know, I, I do stuff that makes <laughs> yeah. it worse. But yes, yeah, I think no, that's I got that. that, that, that yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, 
And then uh, group three was Catherine, Laurie, Manuel, and Rebecca, which is quite a large group. Um, but uh, who would like to share from your group? Yeah, we'll I can share. To... Oh, sorry. go ahead, go Larry. Ahead. No, you, you go ahead. Okay, I'll just I'll share a little bit. Um, So I think what came up with us, too, with having to share maybe what you know what wrongs we've done or how we want to change things is that um it's embarrassing <laughs> it feels kind of embarrassing to do that in front of other people and um maybe we feel guilty about it you know so i think that can be a hindrance to um i guess divulging you know maybe what wrongs we've done to others um we also talked a little bit about um uh, on the, the opposite spectrum uh, in Catholicism, how it's different. Um, and it's, you know, more private and you confess and it all has to do with seeking forgiveness from God as well. Um, I think that was most of it, but Laura, you can go ahead if you gleaned uh, some other ideas. It was also hard for us to come up with things. And like there was one thing I came up and I'm not going to share it here, but and then after I shared, I realized there were other things I, that were worse that I could have shared. They weren't too embarrassing to share, and I could have shared them. That might have been a better choice. But yet, I guess my mind kind of didn't want to admit those or something like that. Yes. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Um, Manuel or Rebecca, or uh, sorry, um, Catherine? Yeah, um, one thing that was embarrassing for me to admit is that um, I don't really do a lot of bad or a lot of good, so that was why it was hard for me to think of anything that I've done lately that I should be uh, atoning for. So um, yeah. maybe what I need to resolve is to do more in my life so I'll be able to think of more things that I've done lately if I have to think <laughs> of something I've done lately. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. Manuel, did you have anything to say? No, I think pretty much everything's been said now for here. Thanks. No, no problem. Thank you. Um, Okay, uh, James or Paula, or Betty Ann. Well, you sort of said what we, we talked about, illness and things like that, and what we felt we had control over and what we didn't. But I just had a comment on what was just talked about, if I can remember it. Um, oh, the, the thing about confessing. I mean, the idea is you're actually realizing what you did wrong and sincerely wanting to not do that again so i i think the it's embarrassing to say you did it but if you're honestly lived and learned that maybe saying that to someone is a is helpful to you in other words to say i i did this wrong but i realize now how that was wrong and i you know i'd like someone to uh I, i'd like to apologize you know what i mean in other words it's embarrassing if i guess it, you could say it's embarrassing but it but it's a, you learn something and you're sort of saying that you learned it. I don't know. This is maybe isn't the time yeah. to be saying that because that's more of a general discussion, but it just occurred to me when somebody, when they talked about embarrassing. Yeah. Embarrassing it was. But, um, that, yeah. yeah. Oh, go ahead, Paul. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, go ahead. I, I was going to say one thing that did, I did come to my mind in some of the conversations folks have had about Catholicism and other Christian traditions that emphasize forgiveness from God. Well, I don't think that's a terribly helpful concept. I do think psychologically it did serve a purpose for me at one point in my life, and that was it did make it easier to forgive myself. And I do find it more challenging now when, for instance, I have done something that I know is wrong. I know it has hurt other people. And maybe even I've tried to make amends with that other person, and they don't even see it as wrong. I know it's wrong. They don't see it that way. And I find it really hard to let go of that thing that because I see, oh, this was bad. This was harmful. And I would say the one thing I miss about my Christian days was this sense of that 
well, I can make peace with God and then I can let, let it go. And now it's just a little harder to let it go because it really is me letting it go. And so I don't know what the answer is to that other than to say that I think even toxic ways of engaging with ideas can sometimes still serve psychological purposes. And I wish I had a better solution for that. And I don't have one yet. Is the, is the person just being polite to you, do you think? or who, It could be, or it could be just a circumstance, or, or it also may be when you're aware of something you've done wrong, but for various reasons, it's impossible to really, for instance, opposing counsel in, as a lawyer, the other side, maybe I have said something uncouth to them. Um, it's often not appropriate for me to go back to opposing counsel and try to make amends for a variety of professional reasons. Even though I personally, my ethics say it was wrong, I didn't break the rules of court. But I, that's the kind of stuff that I'm thinking about where I just, I, I did not live up to the standards I set for myself. And yet society disagrees with me. The other person disagrees with me. Mm -hmm. uh, I just need to let it go or accept the fact that, okay, in this moment, I did not live up to my standards. I'll have to do better next time. But sometimes it's hard to let it go. And, yeah, and it well, isn't yeah. there, I understand say, yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, because I always say it's a, a and it's sometimes, between me and me. Yeah, and yeah. sometimes it's not appropriate to to ask someone's forgiveness or they've died or you know, you're out there saying, they do dress sometimes that. you you think that you might have done something to harm someone, but you don't know the person and there's no way to trace them or find out if you did harm or not. So you have to live with the fact maybe I harmed the person, maybe I didn't. I'm never gonna know. Oh, absolutely. Well, I think about all of the homophobic, terrible things I said as a teenager and young adult. And I've I've hunted down a few of my friends from those days and said, I was sorry. I was wrong. I did not understand the world very well. But not all those people I can find. And it's hard, hard to let it go when you when you know the impact of your your behavior. Yeah. OK, thank you, everyone. That was really useful. Um. Okay, so uh, can somebody read for me? Okay. Traditional Sephardic Jews spend the month of Elul reciting Selehot, prayers of petition. Ashkenazim do this from the Saturday night preceding Rosh Hashanah. Selehot petition for forgiveness for a number of wrong thing wrongdoings. So the most famous are Adon Ha Selehot and Ben Adam. Yeah. So during the month of Elun, the Fadin um, spends the evening reciting and singing uh, to traditional tunes, prayers of petition so for forgiveness. So during Elul, you're supposed to uh, do this process. You're supposed to begin this process of the sugar, which includes what we've just done together. And you're supposed to really look at yourself. What did I do? So somebody mentioned that they couldn't think of anything, but now after afterwards, they thought of something. Um, so it's things like that, and all, the, all of that heaviness and that that the weight of doing it, and trying to think, you know, dig deep and say, okay, what have I done? And then there are all these petitions that you're supposed to do. Um, and yeah, there's two very famous uh, PU team which are called Adon Aselichot and Ben Adam. And um, without Adon Aselichot and Ben Adam, the high holidays for Sephardim would be empty. So I want us to uh, have a look at what they are. And we also included them last year. Um, and I uh, rewrote um, Adon Aselichot to have humanistic language. And um, can we uh, read one line each and then um, say together the Hatanu Chavarim Rachamu Aleinu? We have fallen short, friends have mercy on us. So we could all do that together. So uh, maybe stay on, maybe stay on mute. Um, one person reads uh, a line for us, and then we all say together the what's it called? The refrain, is it? Yeah, the yeah. one that says "time to." Yeah. So if one person could read the first line, and then we all say together, 
Hassan Khairi. Compassionately consoling, deeply delving, empathetically expressing, freely forgiving. We have fallen short, friends. Have mercy on us. Gently guarding, happily helping, inwardly imagining, kindly knowing. We have fallen short, friends. Have mercy on us. Lovingly learning, mindfully moving, nicely nurturing, openly observing. We have fallen short, friends. Have mercy on us. Patiently pardoning, rapidly releasing, sincerely speaking, truly trusting. Atanu Khaverim Rachamu Aleinu. We have fallen short, friends. Have mercy on us. Compassionately consoling, deeply delving, empathetically expressing, freely forgiving. Atanu Khaverim Rachamu Aleinu. We have fallen short, friends. Have mercy on us. Gently guarding, happily helping. Inwardly imagining, kindly knowing. We have fallen short, friends. Have mercy on us. Lovingly learning, mindfully moving, nicely nurturing, openly observing. We have fallen short, friends. Have mercy on us. Patiently pardoning, rapidly releasing, sincerely speaking, truly trusting. We have fallen short, friends. Have mercy on us. And this is the original tune sung at the Kotel of the Western Wall. Human being, why are you sleeping? Arise and call out in supplication. Pour out your words. Seek forgiveness from relatives and from friends. Wash and purify. Do not delay before days pass. 
hurry to seek assistance before the Day of Atonement. Ben Adam Alecha Nerzam Kum Kera Betachanunim, the Fok Sicha de Rostelicha Mekerudim Behaverim, Rehatu Tehar Beal Tehar, Beterem Yamim Ponim, Umhera Ruth Lezra Livne Yom Hakipurim. And that goes like this. The original goes like this. Ben Adam Malecha Nerdam. Breakout rooms? Do you want, or do you? Are, are you um, I think that? I, I think I can do it. Um, okay, great. Yeah. We're we're not doing this like before. We're in different rooms this time. Looks like we're in different rooms. I'm not completely sure. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, we are in different rooms. Yeah.
I have a, is Martin here? Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. The Salchot that you, that we read was very positive. These are all these positive things. Forgive me if I didn't live up to that. Is that the traditional attitude no. of the Salchot? Or is it different? Or is it more negative? Um, it depends. It's not, it's not necessarily negative, no. It I mean, does say... You said that, you know, we've all done this, uh, we've all done that, you know, that that type of thing, which is, I yeah. associate with Yom, Yom Kippur, which is all negative. Yeah, no, they are... Forgive us for these negative things. But I love the way this Salakot that you read was all these positive things, and sorry if I didn't live up to that. I just, I really love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As far as our group went, however, we thought it would take some time to figure out. <laughs> and uh, we yeah. would, and the other two folks came from a Christian background, so they didn't have any, um, maybe it was all completely new to them, I, I guess. They didn't actually say, but um, they couldn't, in other words, I tried to ask that question in the group and they had no idea <laughs> to the answer. So so the answer is that it is positive, the, the traditional salahad as far as what is being mentioned in the first line? Acting yeah, um, it's, it's a combination of things, yeah. I see. Yeah, yeah Adana Selichot is positive. It's positive, yeah. yeah, I, I, yeah. I, really, I really like the positive thing, and this is because it just says what you're supposed to live up to. Yeah. Rather than focusing on what, you know, what your failures yeah. might be or not, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's about clothing the naked, looking after the poor, all of these kinds okay. of things. Yeah, yeah. So, does anybody have any ideas about what your study looks like? We all just agreed that we liked the music. It was very beautiful and powerful. Oh, yeah. Yeah, very much. I mean, it's just the, uh, I mean, I like the, the type of music, the Middle Eastern music, Israeli music, and we were talking about that, that even though, you know, I'm totally not intellectually with religions, I have major issues, but the emotional part, I mean, you know, and when I was in uh, Jerusalem, also at the Western Wall and stuff, and it's just, that just, just something which touches you, even though you're, you know, you're intellectually, you, you just don't jive, but emotionally. And so I find that 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 music just carries something that words by themselves, you know, just just the the, the the meaning of the words cannot. So I think there's there's something. I think it adds something one way or the other. I think the singing and, and even I think even that's the other thing. I mean, for me, it's like I'm I'm totally not a group person, <laughs> but even there as being part of a collective in a sense, it also carries. I think the spirit in a way of, 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 yeah, of, of forgiveness and of, 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 of yeah, I, I don't know. For me, it, it's very interesting because intellectually, I just don't totally don't jive with a lot of it, but the emotional part, the, the meaning of it, um, I find very beautiful. So I was very touched actually by both of the, both of the videos that you showed mm. and the music. So, yeah. Nice. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. Well, I, I know this is, you might share this next class or meeting or session, but uh, yeah, music, I mean, music can be used to uh, to make you think all kinds of things, even things that you don't mean, but because you like the music. I mean, music is, is but uh, that being said, I, I was thinking that like uh, that, traditional Avino Malkeinu uh that it's it's very beautiful. No? So I was I I I saw that there was this um secular version that has been written, a humanist version that has been written, but I of course I haven't heard it sung, but I said okay because when I was listening to the music I said okay this 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 song is beautiful whether you believe it or not, no. I mean, Yuma Keno means my, you know, my father, my our, our, our father, our God, our, our king, and is talking to God in, in Yom Kippur. Uh, but uh, we were speaking in, in in the in the group that uh, also singing 
singing collectively is something that has its own uh, seductions. It it's, can be very comforting, nurturing. It gives you endorphin, endorphin highs. Uh, but the fact that you are reciting things that can allude to things that you want to address, uh, it can make a space, an uh, emotional space to think for thinking about them or for, uh, you know, doing that shuva process. Uh, I've never done that in in a ritual context. Uh, I carry my gills around all year round. <laughs> so, and, I, and not because of Catholicism or Christianity or anything like that. That's my, but, but I think it can be in interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Gabrielle. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Anybody else has any um, thoughts about what your study chok would look like? I think in our group we talked a fair bit about how that a rule that we had kind of complicated feelings about it, but that uh, I think several some of us talked about how that we often do other things besides silicote. Uh, that that I think we I think I, for me at least I'd like to go back and delve in more into silicote, but especially we. Uh, I, I know several of us did a lot of journaling during during the little season. We do other things, and I did share in the group how that the one year that I did very little for a little leading up to how I had holidays. I remember feeling for the high holiday services that it just wasn't the same, and it really convinced me that you really need to invest into a little to make the high holidays meaningful. So, uh, but unfortunately, we didn't get to the point of think rethinking Salakot itself. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so on that note, uh, we can quickly look at how to interpret the high holidays for ourselves. So, um, can I get people to read, please? Use holidays to reflect on the past and look to the future. Consider how we did as individuals and a community. Look forward, Look forward to, to upcoming year and how we might do better. More, solution, more than solutions, not about going back to the gym. Yeah. So it's not like New Year's resolution like that. Yeah. Yes. What, what kind, kind of, of people? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, there you go. Okay. What kind of people are we and who do we want to be? Uh, connects to all previous years, history, family, and ancestry. Yes. One of the things um, that I find interesting because in Judaism, um, in general, we do think a lot about our ancestors, our lineage, um, and we remember those people. I know I was brought up to remember, including my great-grandparents, who I never met, although I did meet one of my great-grandmothers, but I was a baby. Um, so um, lighting candles for their anniversaries, things like that. And I have a particular great, one of my great-grandmothers, who was very abusive. Um, and she came from a very extremist family. And that when I was doing research into my ancestry, I found somebody who was related to, um, to me through her brother. And I asked him about this, uh, do you know anything about this? And he said, yes, uh, th that family, th her parents and her grandparents were, were very uh, religious um, and they treated women really badly. So she treated her daughter really badly, who treated her daughters really badly. Um, so that comes down to my parents' generation. And I started to look at that and think, okay, I've never been comfortable with having her photo. Um, I've, I don't put it on the wall or anything. But, but now maybe I might try to uh, forgive something about who she was by trying to understand the misogyny that she lived under and the patriarchy that she lived that she lived with. So it's not as 
not that it's an excuse for abusive behavior, but maybe I can do something to do to shiver for the memory of my great grandmother. So there's mm -hmm. also this kind of included into shiver. Um, okay, uh, could we continue to read? What still works for us in terms of beliefs and what does not? Right. What is the impact that our negative beliefs and not just, and I don't see the thing here, and not just religious, yeah. Yeah, what is the impact should be of our negative beliefs, yeah. Shifting our values to be more open and inclusive. Chosenness versus universalism and humanism. The fear of femininity, misogyny, homophobia, and racism. By the way, anybody, if you want to stop at any point and say anything about any of these points, just go ahead. I'd say add fear of... So I'm, I'm not on... Um, yeah, I'd say add fear of mascul <clears throat> masculinity as well. Yeah. You want to say something more about that? Oh, um don't think there's too much I can say. Um I think just as some people are afraid of femininity, some people are afraid of masculinity, um, both in other people and and in themselves. Mm. Although to be honest, I I don't um I don't I don't find ideas of masculinity and femininity particularly useful. I think that uh, an action or a behaviour is is either should be judged good or bad by its consequences and what's considered feminine or masculine varies culturally and it's it's just an association. I don't think any action or behaviour is intrinsically masculine or feminine. Um but most of the world doesn't think that way. Um right, sure. Yeah. But it could be part of your teshuva to to think about that and deconstruct that for yourself. I think I already have over a period of yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, did you mean one's teshuva, not my, not mine personally? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's fine. I was going to say that um, I really like the line shifting our values to be more open and inclusive. Chosenness versus universalism and humanism. That to me is one of the biggest reasons I'm here. Is that that shift from chosenness to universalism and humanism. I just feel like that is so important. And I know I can even get caught into, you yeah. know, like groupthink versus connecting to all of humanity. So I, I really appreciate that. One thing that kind of ties with that to me is looking at blind spots, looking at things that I might have lied to myself about, have not seen, have turned my way, turned myself away from, whether it's racism, whether it's any other situation of oppression, and trying to lean into it and not um, be defensive or not um, not hear different points of view. Yeah. I also want to open up the concept of chosenness, that it's not just about Jewish chosenness, but ethnocentricity that a lot of people especially people from the global north think that it's our job to save people from the global south um or that we are somehow morally better um and and also as humanists and and as uh agnostics or atheists we can think that we are morally better than theists or religious people um so i think that chosenness versus universalism has that element to it too one flaw that I have a lot and I have to fight over and I don't always realize I'm doing it is egotism is the feeling of superiority, not necessarily about specific biases, but just that feeling of enjoying feeling better than other people. And I really have to fight against it. I don't always know that I'm doing it until afterwards. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, funnily enough, I, we were talking about 
uh, this yesterday. I don't know if you were there, but uh, that sometimes uh, I have to get out down of my high horse when I think, okay, I'm humanist, I'm secularist, and my my sometimes it gets hard for me to relate to theistic people. And sometimes, uh, well, uh, maybe their life situation is such that that's the only thing that works. It, it doesn't mean it's be I'm better or, or worse. Now, I know this in my head. I, I always know in my head. My thing is, how, how does it work in my... Uh, how do I don't let myself become hubristic or think, oh, I'm superior because I don't believe... I don't have superstitions. Or whatever you know, mm. or yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly, yeah. And the I think this is uh, I think it's the last one. Uh, Shuba mm -hmm. requires making amends with the people we have wronged. As I mentioned before, forgiveness from God is only about sins committed against God. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's not the last one. <laughs> um, you, you, I wanted to make a comment on uh, yeah that before about uh, ethnocentricity. Are you sure that it's um? That moral superiority is um, that much worse in the global north is isn't that something? Don't most cultures generally think that their way is the best way? Oh, oh yes. No, well, I mean, y yes, um, but from the sense of believing that we can, you know, invade another country to liberate it from from its own problems, or you know, that's not really something that the global south is doing to the global north. I see. Um, so from so that that kind of perspective, you know, like um, yes, we all think that all cultures do think that. That's a very good point, but um, we don't therefore take action to enforce other people to adhere to our moral values. Well, Martin, but you know, I have to say, I mean, that's because that's because they don't have the power, right? I mean. I think I think what uh, I'm sorry, Adam. I think his name was. I, I think is a really important point. I mean, if you talk to people from different parts of the world, I mean, you realize racism and and haughtiness and conceit and whatever that, that goes every every which way, you know. And I think I think it's just been that you know certain countries in the world has had had have had a certain you know whatever you know technological, economic, military. Terry, uh, superiority and they've exercised it in ways but i think that that's such a universal human trait you know and i think to be aware of that also i think is is, is also you know important that it, it's 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 an it's a universal human trait but what i'm saying and it's a universal human cultural trait that we all right. fall to these you know tribalisms and and believing that we're the better ones and i think right. uh, we need to keep but that in it mind. doesn't right but it doesn't diminish our responsibility to not do that you know yeah. acknowledging acknowledging that other cultures also do it doesn't diminish or take away from our responsibility not to do it and oh, absolutely most, yeah, no. yeah, but, yeah and most of us here do come from countries not all of us but most of us do come from countries that do have that power you know so we we should not add to that you know I yeah. um, I I I don't think that racism is a, a universal to human cultures. Um, I think xenophobia is. Um, yeah. I think every society has xenophobic individuals, and I would Martin is better versed in anthropology than I am, and I believe it's quite common for cultures to go through phases of being quite culturally open. And then quite culturally and uh, closed-minded and xenophobic, and to to oscillate between um, peace and cooperation and war um, regarding neighbouring cultures. Um, I think um, I mean talking about imperialism. Um, when the Ethiopian emperors got their hands on European weaponry, um, they suddenly turned very nasty to the to their Muslim neighbours. Their Muslim and, and so called pagan neighbors. So, however, I want to, to stop for a second because Shuva is um, 
not about what the other does. It's about what I do, okay. what we do. <laughs> yeah. So um, being a community that recognizes what, what we do, what we have done and how we can repair that. Um, so that, of course, these are very good points and anthropologically it's true, but Shuva is not about examining what other people do. Does that make sense? Gotcha. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Thanks. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, the last comment there is that uh, we've all sinned against our fellow humans in the past year. I've probably done it in the past week, maybe less. Uh, some people in the group uh, claim to have not sinned against anyone in the last week. Um, I think maybe you have. <laughs> and uh, you might you might need to think about it. Um, so uh, just moving on very quickly, uh, the Book of Life. Um, so part of the High Holidays is this idea of the Book of Life, that God writes in um, in some mystical book all of your good deeds, all of your bad deeds, and puts people into three groups of um, the bad, the good, and the in-betweeners. Uh, and, it, and it kind of gets sealed on uh, Yom Kippur. Um, so um, taking that, I want to set a uh, task, because we didn't have any pre class uh, task. So I want to set one for um, after this, post class, that's it. So what is our book of life and what story would it tell? What is our character development like in our, in our book of life? And what could our next few chapters look like? And then that's just something to think about. And then write one stanza using the theme of Ben Adam. So just one one stanza and share it on our Facebook. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you might want to take a screenshot and and I'll mention it for the anyone who's not on the Facebook group um, or just doesn't do Facebook. You can also email it to Martin or myself as well. Yeah. Okay. So that's the end of part one of the class. Um,